A very warm welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Faster, Smarter Decisions with Explainable AI in Stock Prediction. In this webinar, we will discuss how to get started with leading edge AI that business leaders and machine learning practitioners can understand, explain, and readily deploy. I would like to begin by introducing our speaker today, Josh Pantani. Josh is the CEO and co-founder of Boosted.ai. Since starting Boosted.ai in 2017, the company has helped dozens of investment managers whose AUM totals over $1 trillion implement machine learning in their portfolios. As a student at the University of Waterloo, Josh co-founded his first company, Maluba, a deep learning natural language processing company. He has eight patents to his name, all of which are core Maluba IP. Maluba was later bought by Microsoft. Josh was also a principal machine learning engineer at Bloomberg for four years and led many mission critical initiatives. Without further delay, I'll pass it on to Josh. Perfect, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, so just as a little bit of really quick background, uh, I'm the CEO of Boosted AI and we've basically built a platform that is designed to make it easy to incorporate uh, machine learning and alternative data into investment management. And as Sarah sort of mentioned, we have clients all over the world, um, China, US, into Europe. Our smallest client is a $100 million family office and our biggest client is um, a long only shop with hundreds of billions under management. So we've seen a fairly wide variety in different attempts to incorporate machine learning into investment management. And I would argue that the number one thing that's holding it back today um, is really the sort of core black box nature of a lot of new machine learning systems. You know, if a model makes a prediction and you're a fundamental manager and, and that prediction agrees with what your uh, thesis is, then it could give you a little bit of added conviction. But if a machine says this stock is a short, and you're currently long, it can be really hard to actually take any action on that information. Uh, and in general, even putting that aside, even if you're sort of purely quantitative, uh, it's important to understand what's driving your model, if your model actually learns something good, um, and you know, under what circumstances is gonna do well and what, uh, what circumstances is gonna do poorly. Um, so I'm gonna talk largely at kind of two levels. Uh, at the first, throughout the presentation, I'm going to try to go back to why interpretability is useful, how you can actually use it to incorporate machine learning into an investment process. And then I'm also going to go very, very deep level where I'm going to be talking about some of the finance specific problems with trying to incorporate uh, sort of traditional interpretability um, and, uh, and traditional machine learning. So it'll be a combination of some high level you know, kind of here's how to use these techniques um, and really low level deep breakdowns um, and some of the core math and uh, what you actually need to do to modify these techniques to the approach uh, to the domain. Um, so we'll start with why interpretability matters. Um, we'll talk about some of the challenges that I think are specific to stock picking. Um, we're going to go into a few model specific approaches and then we're going to really heavily focus on model agnostic approaches. Um, and how to really modify them and use them within the financial domain. Um, and then a few times we'll kind of come back and show examples of here's how you can actually use it um, from a uh, incorporating into your investment management process standpoint. So right off the bat, why does interpretability matter? Well, you know, as I kind of mentioned earlier, a lot of fundamental managers are gonna be sort of distrustful of the black box algorithm. If you don't know what's driving the machine, uh, could be very difficult to have any level of confidence. And that's not exactly an incorrect position to take because it's very possible for a machine to say, learn something like a factor bias, right? Maybe you have a machine that just learned momentum and that's always gonna buy momentum. Or maybe you have a machine that learned something that is regime specific, or maybe you have a machine that just learned something utterly spurious. So it's not actually in our view, false to have a distressful view of the black box. Uh, there's a lot of value in being able to understand what did the machine actually learn? But I think the other thing too is that, you know, if I go back to that example where you want to own a stock long and the machine wants to just short it, if you don't have any context in why it wants to short it, it's not useful. But if the machine can say, well, 
analysts think that this stock is going to have a really good quarter, but credit card data shows it's going to have one of the worst quarters in history. Suddenly it gives you a hook. It gives you something where you can actually go out, do your own research and start combining a little bit of sort of human machine understanding. And in our view, we think that can actually do better uh, than either the human or the machine on its own. Uh, I guess the other thing too, is if you know the hooks, you understand what the machine actually learned, it gives you a lot of power to make sure that it's sort of learning the right kinds of lessons. Uh, and this really also relates to the third thing, which is that the financial markets are extremely noisy. And even if you have a really good job of noise reduction, uh, it's quite possible for your model to learn something uh, that's incorrect, that is regime specific, that is factor specific. Uh, and so being able to come back and say, well, this is what's really driving the model. This is the set of things that it's learned gives you a good idea if you've actually built a good model or not. Uh, and then finally, and this is very true if you're a purely quantitative machine learning driven firm, um, a lot of times allocators coming in want to kind of understand what's driving the model. What, what's causing the drawdowns? What are, why is it doing poorly in some environments and well in other environments? What, and then in the future, what are the set of environments in which we'd expect a model to do well? And what are the set of environments in which we'd expect the model to do poorly? So interpretability kind of matters um, across the entire sector, I would argue. Uh, and just to really start off, right, and we'll take a look at it from a sort of fundamental view. One of the biggest challenges is the way that a lot of sort of quantum mental and fundamental users, um, if they do incorporate any kind of quantitative thinking, use it, uh, tends to be quite a bit different than what machine learning does, right? I mean, one of the most common things is just coming in and, and doing some stock filters, right? So in this example, I'm coming in and I'm saying, give me all the technology companies with a market cap greater than a billion and a you know, PE ratio greater than 20. Um, or, you know, maybe you go a step further and you incorporate a linear regression, but in a linear regression, you know, a variable uh, is either positive or the variable is negative. There is no nuance or set of context. Um, and machine learning is, is very, very different because it can kind of learn that context matters. It can learn that for some types of stocks, maybe PE matters. So, you know, maybe if I'm dealing with uh, industrial stocks or I'm dealing with uh, materials or oil companies, maybe in that case, PE matters. Um, but maybe if I'm dealing with technology stocks, uh, price earnings growth is what matters. Um, or, you know, alternatively, maybe uh, for an industrial company, uh, momentum and, and, and momentum in the sense of mean reversion is what matters. So maybe I want to take an anti-momentum tilt in industrial companies, but maybe for technology companies, I want it to be just sort of long momentum, right? So in some case, maybe uh, I want to go in the opposite direction of momentum and I want to do more of a mean reversion case. In some cases, maybe I want to focus just on long-term momentum. Well, a machine can figure out that nuance, but if you're just used to these simple stock filters or you're just used to simple regression, the idea that momentum can contribute to a buy in some cases and contribute to a sell in other cases can be a little bit alien. And so we need to be both taking these lessons in order to get the maximum power of the machine, uh, but we need to be giving our explanations in a way that sort of makes intuitive sense. Um, and I guess sort of the last thing is a, uh, for a successful machine learning model, a uh, model's input space can be extremely large, right? If you're used to these very simple sort of multi-factor models, two to three factors, um, a lot of times we find if you're doing a more advanced machine learning model, you really want more like 60 or 70 factors. That can be, uh, a little bit difficult to get your mind around. Um, and then finally, capital markets data is extremely messy. Uh, and so we need to find ways to sort of filter and transform that data. Um, but that can also be kind of unintuitive, right? So, you know, some of the problems you might see in underlying data, um, you might see data that has an issue uh, with say non-stationarity. So the example I always like to talk about is having uh, $1 billion of revenue in 1980 means something fundamentally different than having $1 billion of revenue in 2020. Um, on the same saying, uh, for some companies, a significant portion of your revenue is gonna come in say the fourth quarter. Uh, and for some companies, a significant portion of your revenue will just kind of be distributed throughout the year. And so for some data sets, you have to deal with seasonality, you have to deal with non-stationarity. You have to deal with um, other types of sort of fundamental problems. So underneath the hood, when you're actually building your model, the machine needs to normalize and transform the data in different ways. But it can be really unintuitive if you're presenting to a user, you know, um, the Z scores of revenue on a 
256 day basis, um, cross sessionally compared in you know, some particular set. It can be really, really confusing if you just present it in that base way. You have to find a way of transforming the actual input space that your model is looking at into something that a human can understand. So in this example for revenue, it could be a lot more intuitive if you say, well, this company has really strong revenue, really strong revenue or really strong revenue growth relative to its peers. And that's contributing to it being a buy decision as opposed to taking a look at the raw transformation. And so if we wanna kind of define the problem, ultimately we wanna build the best models. We want models that are predictive and, and we use information coefficient, which basically means for the, um, for the set of ranks, the set of predictions I'm making, I want the highest possible correlation uh, to the actual raw return of my stock. So if I you know, rank hundred stocks, I want my number one stock ideally um, to have the highest return over my investment horizon. I want my number two stock to have the number two return, et cetera. And so we're trying to maximize uh, the rank correlation between the ranks and the actual set of companies that have returns. Uh, and as part of that, we ideally want the biggest possible spread between our top 20% of stocks and our bottom 20% of stocks. Um, and then we wanna be able to build explanations around these really advanced nonlinear models that conform to a manager's understanding of the world. Um, and, and we kind of define that in really two ways. So number one, we want explanations that are actually reflective of what the model's doing, but we also want explanations that are intuitive where a significant portions of users look at those explanations and say, okay, I understand why the machine is doing that. I can incorporate that into my process. Uh, and so we kind of evaluate that second part in really two ways. The percentage of users who rate an explanation as useful versus not useful. And then as we're building out new explanation models, you can kind of A-B test um, model A versus model B, which of the sets of explanations do users tend to prefer. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit later in the talk about how we evaluate how good a job we're doing of explaining what the model is actually doing. That's a, a little bit more of a technical thing. And so to kind of jump this down onto an example, Given a specific universe, say the S&P 500, uh, and in an input space of features that we care about, um, so you know, we'll just say balance sheets or uh, maybe some technical features or uh, maybe analyst recommendations, um, and a particular investment horizon. So maybe I'm trying to invest across a 21-day horizon, maybe a one-day horizon, maybe a you know one to two-year horizon. Um, we want to create a model that, for those constraints, has a really high information coefficient does a really good job of predicting the set of stocks that are going to beat the benchmark and predicting the set of stocks that are going to lose to the benchmark. Um, and we want those set of signals to be something that can be turned into a portfolio with desirable traits, right? And those desirable traits can vary. Maybe it's, I want to maximize my sharp. Maybe uh, I just want to minimize my drawdowns over time. Maybe I want to uh, reduce the overall volatility, uh, but whatever, you know, we want a set of signals that can be turned into some kind of portfolio with some set of metrics, depending on what you want to do. Um, and we want this model to be something where we can give explanations that a fundamental PM can understand, we can incorporate. And so on that front, there's really kind of a number of different ways um, that we like to show and visualize what the model actually learned. Um, so the first is, is this screen, which is basically at a global level. This is showing for a particular model um, all the different variables that it's looking at, the size is how important that variable is, and the distance is how much those variables were kind of used together. So this is showing that analyst expectations was really, really important, but it was really important when you consider it relative to the market cap or relative to the sector that it was in. And this actually makes a lot of sense because we know larger cap companies tend to have more analyst coverage than smaller cap companies. So it's kind of cool that the machine figured out analyst expectations are important, but the context of the market cap matters. And similarly, analyst expectations are important, but the sector that I'm in matters. And so this can already kind of give us an idea, uh, not just what are the variables that are important, but how do these variables interact with each other? And what is the sort of joint context they're getting? So this gives us, you know, high level, did the machine learn some things that makes intuitive sense? Um, and then at the next level, what we find is that there's some set of variables where the machine needs context. It might be a really, really important variable, but it's a really important variable in context. And there's some types of variables where it is just always important. And so on this particular screen, um, a higher orange value uh, means that 
a variable has uh, is at the high level. Uh, a blue value means that the variable is at the lower level. The further to the right something is, the more indicative of uh, of a buy. And the further to the left it is, the more indicative of a sell. And so if I see something where I go to the right and it's universally orange and I go to the left and it's universally blue, uh, that tells me that that variable in and of itself uh, is, is a strong predictor and it doesn't need any context. So in this particular example, assets to price ratio, this is saying if you have a really good assets to price ratio, that's a strong buy signal. And you don't, you know, other contexts might help, but you don't necessarily need context. Um, but if I see something that's really, really mixed, like the nine month uh, price momentum, this is saying that's a really important variable. There's information, but you need context. Sometimes having a high price momentum is a good thing and it's a buy signal. And sometimes having high price momentum is actually a bad thing and it's a sell signal. Um, and simultaneously, sometimes having a low um, price momentum is a good thing and sometimes it's a bad thing. You need context on it. And so this is kind of a cool screen because it tells you, here's a set of variables where it's just learned it's positive or negative. And if it's positive or negative, that's something great. You can just kind of incorporate it on its own. And then here's a set of variables where it's an important variable. It's really, really critical to understanding the market or the universe that you're evaluating, but you need to combine it with other things. Um, and then that kind of leads into the next side of, okay, how are these variables interacting with each other? Um, and this, I think, is kind of a cool thing. So you can see for this particular model, um, it's saying that for... Um, uh, for the information technology sector, having price momentum is a good thing. If I have uh, a higher price momentum, I'm more likely to be a good buy. And if I have a lower price momentum for the technology sector, I'm more likely to be a sell. And that kind of makes sense. We think a little bit about how that sector has behaved over the past little while. Uh, on the flip side, if I look at industrials, and, and by the way, this is for a European model, it's a little more context. Uh, if I look at industrials, it's the exact opposite. It is figured out that for industrials, um, having a high uh, price uh, momentum is actually indicative of, of a likely sell. And having a low price momentum is actually likely indicative um, of a buy. And so in this particular case, it's basically saying for industrials, really mean reversion is much more important than momentum. For technology, for this model, it thinks that uh, momentum is important, but for industrials, it says mean, mean reversion massively overpowers it. And then you can make other intuitions from this. You know, maybe more things in industrials tend to be range bound, whereas things in technology tend to sort of break out or, you know, it could be a whole bunch of other patterns. Um, and this, this gets really, really cool for a few different reasons. You know, number one, it gives you an understanding, what did the model actually learn? How are these variables being used together? But the other thing is that if you don't want to use the model itself, you can actually use some of these machines to sort of build these linear sort of rules of thumbs. So once I know that the machine has identified that um, mean reversion uh, in the industrial sector for Europe is an important signal, I can use the model and I can use all the different patterns it's figured out, or I can just go out and decide, okay, why don't I just look for uh, companies that look like they're about to mean revert in the industrial sector. And that then creates a very simplified rule, which as a fundamental manager or as a you know single factor um, uh, quantitative user, you can then just kind of incorporate it. Uh, it just gives the machine a lot more power in terms of how you use it. Certainly, it's, you know, it's excellent to give an idea of where the model came from, but it, the fact that it can give simplified explanations of how it's learning the universe uh, can really help you sort of incorporate it in a few different ways. But you know, let's go with the assumption that you're actually going to use the model to make predictions and you use the model. Um, we can then actually go all the way down to the prediction level and we can say, okay, for the set of stocks that, that you think I should go long or the set of stocks that you think I should go short, why do you think that? What's the lesson? What, what's the pattern that you figured out? And so for this particular example, and it's, I should mention it a little bit old, um, it's saying that it thought at that time, SPG was a good buy. Why did it think SPG was a good buy? Well, because it's got relatively good uh, pre-tax income, or it's got solid assets, uh, it sells to EV was good, all relative, you know, all this relative to its price. And it's got relatively good uh, operating cash flow. So, you know, maybe the stock value got beaten up a little bit, but its books actually still looked really good. So it thought it was a solid prospective buy. Um, we can see for, um, for SLB, um, there was a combination, you know, it's more bullish than negative, but it's saying, look, this is an oil company and oil companies haven't been doing that hot. Uh, it also doesn't have great forward earnings to price. And that's not necessarily a good sign, but uh, it's got, you know, really solid overall. Uh, so, you know, so analysts think that it's, it's future, um, 
revenue is maybe not going to be that great. But as it looks today, the books are actually solid. It's got solid operating cash flow to price. Sell to EV ratio is good. Uh, it's EBITDA is good. And so even though it's an oil sector and even though analysts don't like it, the fact of the matter is it's been beaten up a lot and it's got really solid balance sheet. So we think this is more likely to be a buy than a sell. And then at the very bottom, we can see Timis, um, or sorry, TM US. Um, and it just, there's nothing good about this stock. Uh, it's got really bad uh, EBITDA. Uh, treasuries are at uh, an all-time low, which suggests that it might uh, bounce back up. Um, and it's paying out huge dividends. So it's giving out lots of cash. It doesn't have very much cash right now. Analysts don't like it compared to where it's been historically. Um, and things are about to get a lot harder for it because interest rates are likely to increase. Uh, and so again, it gives you a really intuitive understanding of this is why it hates this particular stock uh, or this is why it likes the stock. And, and you may disagree with the machine, but at least it kind of gives you uh, a different perspective and a different set of ways of, of evaluating it. And then again, if you're just trying to build a solid quantitative model, going through and seeing these explanations gives you a lot of confidence that, okay, this thing learned nuance, it learned something cool and understandable about the market, as opposed to just deciding I'm going to go long momentum every time. Um, so, okay, how do we do this? How do we actually generate these explanations? Uh, I'm just going to really, really quickly touch on some of the older techniques, and I'm going to explain why they don't work. Um, and then I'm going to sort of build up to the, the techniques that we actually use in practice. So kind of your like old school standard approach uh, when you were dealing with trees um, was three things. Uh, you use weight, cover, um, and gain. And so the basic idea behind weight is just look at the number of times that a feature is used to split uh, the data across all the trees. So look at how many nodes, decision nodes you have with the underlying uh, feature. Cover, uh, the number of times that uh, a feature is used um, weighted by the number of training points that go into that split. So not just you know how many splits occurred, but how statistically significant are those splits? Uh, and then gain, which is basically just um, how much entropy did you reduce by, on average, when you were using this feature? Uh, intuitively, those things sound like they should work. The problem is none of them agree with each other. Um, and, and when you actually evaluate them based on local accuracy and consistency, um, it does a very poor job of explaining the set of features that actually explain why you made a given prediction. Or another way to put it is, is the counterfactuals that come out are actually of very poor quality. It does a very bad job of telling you this is what drove uh, a model to make an underlying decision. Um, and, and the same thing can be said of the, uh, of the neural net approaches. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of different model agnostic ones, uh, global surrogate, local surrogate, and SHAP. I'm going to talk about local surrogate and global surrogate because it leads really well um, into how Shapley additive values work. But in general, the main thing you need to understand is that outside of Shap, all of these kind of suffer from a few underlying problems. Uh, the first is local accuracy. And so that is basically um, the how good of a job does the model do explaining why it made a given prediction? So if I want to know why did you buy this underlying stock? How good of a job do you actually do at telling me why you bought that underlying stock? Um, and you know, if I want to say, why do you think this article is a good article? How good of a job does it do actually explaining that? And the reality is all of those approaches outside of Shap are actually quite poor at that. Um, but the other thing, and this is the cardinal sin, uh, is they are not consistent. What do we mean by consistency here? Well, if a feature results in a higher output from model A, than for model B, it should also have a higher explanation score in model A. AK, if a feature is more important for model A than model B, it should be valued higher in model A than model B. And you can show experimentally that that is just not the case. Uh, for any of these methodologies outside of SHAP, uh, it, uh, it, it straight, those properties straight up do not hold true. And so when you actually kind of put any of these techniques outside of SHAP under the microscope, they suffer from major problems. And I'll, I'll kind of prove that to you in a second uh, when I go through line. Um, but, you know, let's kind of take a step back and, and let's talk about the simplest, one of the older techniques, which is called a, a global surrogate. So the basic idea behind a global surrogate is I'm going to take my black box uh, and I'm going to train an interpretable model on it. So maybe I'll train a linear regression on it or I'll train a basic decision tree on it. Uh, something where it's really, really easy. 
Uh, and, and so we're trying to create a linear regression that sort of approximates the original black box. Um, and more ideally, you want to create that linear regression on a set of features that are very intuitive. So, you know, if I was doing, say, uh, an image recognition problem, I would look at individual pixels because ultimately what we're trying to do is say, well, which pixels on the page led to your conclusion? Uh, if I was doing a text problem, I would look at uh, individual characters. So I'm going to say, what you know, characters in a sentence led to this prediction? Um, and in the case of finance, what we're trying to do is look at a more simplified version rather than look at, say, the normalized versions of revenue um, or the you know, normalized versions of, um, of analyst reports or anything like that. We just want to say, how important was revenue to this prediction? And was it a positive thing or a negative thing? How important were analyst reports? How important was credit card data? How important was market moving news to this underlying decision? Uh, and so we, we want to basically strip out all the normalization that we did um, to deal with non-stationarity and seasonality and all those other kinds of fun problems. And so jumping back to global surrogate, what you do is you take your initial feature space, uh, your initial set of training vectors. You do some kind of simplification mapping for that. You know, in the image recognition example, that would be just simplifying it down to the pixels. Um, that creates a simplified set of vectors, of training vectors. And then you're gonna take the non-simplified version of those vectors and you feed them through your black box and you get a set of predictions from that. So now I had a set of simplified feature vectors and I have a set of predictions for my black box. And then I just build a linear regression on that. Um, so I have a linear regression that's basically used my black box as an Oracle and use the simplified version of the feature space. And in theory, this linear regression is gonna somewhat approximate the nonlinear black box. Well, we can take this a step further. And I guess one of the main problems, um, you might do an okay job of consistency with a global circuit, but it starts to do a very, very poor job uh, of explaining local accuracy. Um, explaining exactly why you made a, a particular prediction. And so if we want to address that, we can then extend this into Lime, um, local interpretable models. Uh, and, and the basic idea behind a uh, local interpretable model is for a given prediction, I want to wait everything that I'm feeding into my Oracle based on their proximity to that prediction. So I'm gonna take a particular prediction, you know, why, why do I wanna buy this stock? Or why do I think this image has a baseball in it? Uh, and then I'm gonna create a bunch of perturbations uh, of the underlying feature vector, or alternatively, I could just sample from my original training data, either is fine. Um, and then for each of those uh, perturbations, I then basically say, the closer you are to the prediction vector, the more important you are. And the farther you are from the prediction vector, the less important you are. And so I'm building a linear regression, but I'm weighting all of my vectors based on their proximity to my initial prediction vector. Um, and so in theory, I then produce something that does a really good job of saying, for this particular prediction, what actually drove it. The problem is a few fold. Uh, first of all, your uh, consistency can break down uh, and you can prove that very easily because if you do Lyme uh, centered on different predictions, you'll get radically different results in terms of which features are important. Um, and there's no real way of combining a bunch of different Lyme results into a sort of global result. Uh, and then the second reason that you can prove that uh, consistency is not preserved uh, is that for different variations of the proximity function, you get radically different importance scores. Your features end up in a very different order. And so clearly the consistency principle is violated with Lyme, which basically means, you know, you can get some predictions that are kind of cool, uh, but you can never be totally sure if you've actually properly represented what your underlying space looks like. Um, and so kind of jumping back into Shapley additive explanations, 
our goal is to really make our process compliant, local accuracy, missingness, and consistency. Um, I'm actually going to jump over the math here fairly quickly. Um, but the basic idea behind uh, Shapley is that I'm going to basically look at coalitions of features. I'm going to look at combinations of features working together. And I'm going to make the assumption that we learn the most about a feature when there are either the fewest other features that it's being compared to or the most set of features that it's being compared to. And the reason is that if there's, you know, if there's just your feature and one other feature, then your feature is clearly having a very large impact on the decision. And if there's my feature and many other features, you're learning the most about that feature because you're learning how it affects everything else on a global scale. And you learn the least value and the least information about a feature when half the features are empty because it's neither very important nor is it um nor are you learning about it in a very broad context and so everything else kind of follows the same idea as lime where we're either creating perturbations or we're subsampling um, out of our initial training set we're anchoring this around some particular prediction and we're weighting everything based on some concept of the proximity to that prediction, but the proximity that we use is the Shapley concept of weighting smaller and bigger correlations more importantly um, than the sort of mid-size um, uh, sets. Um, so without really diving into that too much, when we do that, we end up with um, a very solid local explanation of what's driving something. Uh, and we also end up with relatively consistent explanations of what's driving these predictions. And so at this point, we can go through the entire process of um, generating all of the features, again, anchored around a particular prediction. Um, we can weight these set of predictions based on the Shapley concept of, of proximity. We're then going to train using these weights, a particular linear regression, usually linear regression. There's, there's other variants, but usually linear regression. Um, and then we can look at that linear regression to kind of get an explanation about that local model. And because consistency has been preserved, we can combine all of our local predictions across our entire space, kind of add them up, and use that to figure out globally which features are most important for the model as a whole and which features are, are you know most negative for the model as a whole and which are not that important All right, so that's the basic idea um, we're creating a, a linear approximation of the black box model and we're doing it in a way that forces both local accuracy of doing a good job uh, explaining a given prediction um, and also consistency across the entire model where the set of features that are important are actually the set of ones that are getting a, a higher valuation. Now, mapping this all the way back to uh, a PM, we need to make sure that uh, these explanations are not just consistent and locally accurate, but that they sort of match uh, PM's expectations. So rather than take the sort of lowest form, we need to figure out a way of creating a simplified input that they can understand. To kind of show what I mean by that, um, you know, if I'm looking at revenues, I might have a local z-score, I might have some time-weighted score, I might have something that uh, adjusts for the seasonality or whatever. But at the end of the day, what a PM is going to want to see is the growth in revenue of the past four quarters is a bigger contributor to where we think the stock is going to go uh, than say it's price momentum, or it's a bigger contributor to this uh, when you combine it with price momentum or, or something like that. It does, the PMs, generally speaking, not going to want to see the sort of underlined normalized version of it. Um, and so kind of the easiest way for us to address that is to actually treat the normalization 
as part of the black box. So we need to go to a base level where we look at just a simplified input. That's then going to get transformed to the different normalizations. We go through the entire process. But when we're actually trying to build our initial SHAP models, we do it on the simplified version of the input. Uh, and sort of more specifically, you have to also think about different heuristics for how you do that simplification, right? Um, if I have a continuous feature, which is, um, you know, again, like revenue or price momentum, um, or, you know, just direct mean reversion score or anything like that, um, you're going to follow a different set of normalization than if I'm just looking at, say, sector or something like that. And so we take an underlying feature based on how that feature presents itself. We're going to apply a whole bunch of different mappings to it um, based on if it's global, non stationarity, seasonality, follow different distribution, whatever. Um, or in some cases, we're just not going to transform. Those are all going to be the things that are sort of fed through our black box neural net or you know, whatever underlying algorithm you're using. Um, but we're going to use a simplified form when we're actually generating the explanations. Now, um, one of the core problems with SHAP is that it doesn't necessarily care about some of the underlying dependencies that some of the variables have. To some degree, there's some assumption that things are somewhat orthogonal. And as it's doing these samplings, it's doing it across the sort of marginal distribution. Um, and it can sometimes be feeding things through that don't necessarily make sense. Uh, as an example, if a model has, uh, sorry, if, if, if a company has a profitable quarter, the profit value is greater than zero, it must also be the case that their revenue is greater than zero. But if I'm just creating random perturbations, I might be feeding things through the um, perturbed variant of my space, it doesn't actually make any sense, right? It doesn't actually make any sense to test what your model does when profitability is positive uh, and revenue is zero, because that's something that would never actually exist in reality. Um, but the problem is that you go through all these different forms of transformations. Um, and even if you create something that makes intuitive sense for a user, like say PE ratio, if you're just perturbing those sort of ignorantly, you can end up creating perturbations that feed through the entire stack that don't really actually make any sense. And so you can start to get some kind of unintuitive results. And so for us, we have this concept of component features, which are basically for regardless of, of how you regularized it, regardless of how you normalized it, regardless of the set of um, combinations of the underlying features, we need to go all the way back and we have to look at features that relate to each other. So if I'm just looking at total assets divided by market cap uh, and I'm comparing that to say um, cash to price, you need to make sure that you're doing your explanations at the level of total assets and market cap and uh, cash and equivalents and not at the level of sort of assets to price ratio or cash to price ratio. Um, once you've done your explanation at the total assets uh, over market cap, you can then map it back into assets to price ratio. But if you just do it on assets to price ratio while combining, say, cash to price, um, and you're creating perturbations of both of those, you can start inputting stuff into your model. It doesn't make any sense, and it can start affecting the quality of the explanations you give. So for us, we have this element of basically decomposing the simplified input into an even lower level that we call a base component feature. And then at the very end, you have to sort of remap that into the simplified input. So jumping all of this uh, back into the original framework, um, we start with a set of uh, feature vectors um, and predictions uh, that you got from your underlying Oracle. You want to take those feature vectors, transform them into your simplified input and the transfer and transform the simplified input into the components. And then for those components, you want to generate 
the shaft kernel weighting for those components, uh, basically the how important uh, for each of those component feature vectors they are uh, relative to the individual um, prediction, and then again relative to the entire spot. Um, and then you know on the right side we're sort of taking those set of components, we're mapping them back all the way into the original feature space, we're normalizing them, feeding them into the neural net, creating the prediction, and then in the end we can create yet another linear regression, but this time a linear regression uh, that has been built on the uh, sort of base components. Um, and then at this point, we can now generate explanations at the prediction level. Um, we can also repeat the same process for any sets of combinations of features. Uh, and we can use this um, in aggregation across all of our vectors in a training vector to get the global and feature, global, uh, feature score. So we now have a way of figuring out for a given prediction, what's driving it and at a global level, what's driving it. Um, I'm gonna skip over the whole step around um, mapping <laughs> back into your simplified space because I really wanna jump into a few more examples of using this. So again, you know, if we look at the local interactions, um, I think we've got a pretty, a pretty intuitive idea of, of how to generate this. Um, but the other kind of cool thing is um, if you wanted to jump this into a global importance score, we now have a size because we know how important uh, each of the underlying features are. Um, but we also know the combinations of features. Uh, and so we can construct something where we basically try to minimize the distance between every feature based on how much they're used together. And if something's you know, really, really close together, that means that they are used together a lot uh, in, in the prediction. That means in this case, analyst expectations and market cap are much more important together than they are apart. Um, whereas analyst expectations and say asset to price is used a, a lot less. Um, they're, they're less important in making predictions than analyst expectations versus market cap. Now, the other kind of cool thing about this is because we've done a really good job of local accuracy and we've done a really good job of consistency, we can actually start to look at pairs of companies. And, and we found this uh, to actually be one of the most intuitive ways uh, for fundamental managers to incorporate things. And so in this particular example, what we're basically saying um, is for an underlying stock, uh, the, at the top score, how important is this variable to um, explaining it? Uh, and then how, how high a value is this relative to its peers? So in this particular example, the nine month price momentum uh, for say PSX uh, is very high relative to its peers, and it also has a relatively high uh, explanation. And what's even more cool is we can actually then go in and say, for two particular securities, what is driving the difference? You know, I can go in and I can say, for Microsoft versus Oracle, why do you like Microsoft more than you like Oracle? And in, the case, in this case, it likes Microsoft because it thinks the uh, current treasury, uh, uh, sorry, the current interest rate is a more positive thing for Microsoft than it is for Oracle. Uh, it thinks that the momentum that Microsoft has uh, puts it in a better footing than the momentum that Oracle has. Um, and then on the flip side, you know, the uh, forward earnings to price uh, on a relative basis for Oracle is a little bit better uh, than it is for Microsoft. But on the whole, the positives for Microsoft uh, are making it a better buy than, uh, than the positives for Oracle. So this is also really cool, being able to actually go in and, and on a sort of pair basis say, do you like this stock more or do you like these other stocks more? And then you can also kind of extend this idea and say, how does Microsoft compare to all technology companies? And why do you like Microsoft more than other technology companies? Or why do you hate Microsoft more than other technology companies? Why do you like ExxonMobil versus other oil companies? And you know, you really kind of mix and match any of these cohorts. Um, so just kind of really quickly summarizing across the talk. Uh, Basically, explainability and interpretability is, uh, we think, critical for what we see as the next wave, which is combining human and machine learning thinking. It's really important for figuring out what's driving your model and why, but you have to build your explanations in a way that are intuitive, that matches a user's ex expectations, while also doing it in a way that does a proper job of sort of modeling and explaining what it is that your block box actually learned. But when you combine these things together, you can get a very powerful sort of glass box combination, uh, which becomes easy to incorporate into your process. Okay, um, I am at, uh, I'm at the very end uh, and I will open up for questions. Thanks for, your, uh, thanks for your attention. Awesome, thank you so much, Josh.
A uh, lot of great, great questions, uh, great comment. I'll begin with that. Love what you've done and clearly your gray matter is amazing. Um, I do have a question and here's the question. Should a large group of users slash investors apply, these, apply this tool to their investment strategy? Um, won't the consistent application of the platform among a large group then inject a bias on what is influencing uh, the result? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, basically, the way our entire platform is set up uh, is it is kind of an experimental uh, tool, right? So you can come in, you can give the system the set of data that you think is important. You can give the system the goal, right? So for some of our users, the goal is just let's find stocks with the highest alpha or let's find stocks with the highest return. Um, but sometimes you'll have users that come in and they'll say, you know, given analyst data and credit card data, find the companies that are most likely to beat earnings or based on a bunch of technical features and analyst data and market moving news, maybe find companies um, where the implied volatility has a dislocation with how the derivatives market is pricing it um, or find companies that are most likely to see a, a share buyback. Um, and so long story short, um, you know, I would argue that our tool injects no more, no less bias than something like say the Bloomberg uh, terminal where there is a massive wide variety in terms of how you can analyze things and the massive wide variety in terms of the types of models uh, that are built in our system. We just designed to make it easy to incorporate machine learning to solve some of these things that might be a little bit more difficult. Um, I will say this though, in the beginning right now, very few companies are using this kind of technology or, or platforms like this. And so right now, I think there is a massive advantage to using this uh, and, and generating alpha that's sort of in excess of your peers. I think in the long term, sort of five to 10 years from now, we'll move out of a world where technology like this gives you a core advantage and we'll move into a world where you really need technology like this to be competitive. That's, I would argue, the central thesis uh, of my company. Um, you know, just like when you first started using the Bloomberg terminal, uh, it gave you a huge advantage in the bonds market because you gave you transparency in bond pricing. Um, but today, nobody really views buying a Bloomberg terminal as an advantage. It's just something you need to be considered competitive in the space. Anyway, thanks so much for that question. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Next question. Is the underlying stock picking model exactly the same for all the stocks? Um, so generally, no. Um, and I also, you know, going back to my first thing, everyone's kind of building um, a, a different model, but there, there are different ways to approach it and it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, you know, there are some models that are, um, you know, where it has a sort of shared set of parameters where it's trying to make predictions across say, a few hundred different stocks um, and where it is the same underlying model, but the model can kind of learn different nuances. Uh, usually it's learning the nuances at a sector or subsector level, uh, but it is hypothetically possible for it to learn nuances at just a, a stock level. Um, we have, you know, some people will build sort of macroeconomic models where it's just looking at macro sectors as a whole. Um, but there are cases where you may want to be building a, uh, a stock specific model. Um, generally speaking, though, my argument would be if you're trying to do that, it's probably more of an intraday use case because otherwise you don't have a ton of data to work with. Great. Do you do some kind of principal component analysis or dimensionality reduction in your software? Uh, so we generally do that on the portfolio construction side um, there, or rather we have the ability to do that on the portfolio construction side. Um, I think PCA is actually quite limited though. Um, and so we generally like to combine it with something else like topic modeling. Uh, a really big example of, of, of the limitation, right? If you're using something like PCA on just portfolio construction side, basically usually the way you do it is you're looking at underlying correlations. Well, in 2020, SBG, which owns shopping malls, was heavily correlated with retirement homeowners, which were heavily correlated with like fitness equipment owners and, and CCL and things like that. I don't think there has ever been a time in the entire history of the stock market where fitness equipment was heavily correlated with retirement homes, right? And so if you were trying to use PCA to somehow capture the types of risks that you were seeing in March of last year, it probably did a really bad job for you. And same, similarly, when we had that massive blow up in November um, where you saw the, uh, uh, the vaccine news and the reopening news. Again, it was something that if you're just using a basic correlation analysis, you probably didn't do a very good job of. Um, so for us, we use PCA, we think it's, it's an important tool, but we combine it with sort of topic modeling approach. And so to jump back into the example I just talked about, 
You know, we know SPG is related to shopping malls. We know that's related to social distancing. And so that connects us back into COVID. We know that retirement home owners are related to an at-risk demographic, and that relates back to COVID. We know that uh, fitness equipment is related to social distancing, and that relates back to COVID. Uh, and so if you can combine all these things, you can start to think of like a COVID risk factor, a reopening risk factor. If you combine that with something like PCA from portfolio construction side, we think that's really, really powerful. Um, now, if your question is around the signal generation side, uh, yes, we'll also use some of these things on the signal generation side, but there's more about just creating the most idiosyncratic signal so that uh, it feeds into your portfolio construction in a really positive way. Um, a little bit outside of the ex explainability topic, but uh, important question nonetheless. Thank you. Uh, are there any regulatory, regulatory implications that the user needs to be aware of when using the application? Yeah, so right now, um, there isn't a huge amount of restrictions in terms of how you can use machine learning, but I'm actually of the opinion that this technology is going to be much more important over the next five or 10 years as regulators start to look at this space. You know, already we're starting to see allocators care a little bit more about the models. No longer have to say, you know, here's a wonderful back test that does well. You need to be able to explain, well, here's what's driving the model. Here's why, here's the underlying things. Here's the situation where it's going to do well. Here's where it's going to do poorly. You know, here's why it had a really bad month. Um, and, and that's something our system can do. And I think kind of going into the future, as regulators start to look at the space a little bit more, I imagine there's a high probability chance uh, that being able to give mathematically provable explanations about what's driving your model is going to be more important. Um, but as of today, this technology is still largely unrestricted. Uh, but you know, I would, I would just say this is a trend I'm looking at and I think is both important for my business and the industry as a whole. Thank you. When analyzing the success of a model, do you construct a confusion matrix? And if so, which metric do you focus on? Uh, precision, recall, et cetera. Yeah, so generally speaking, um, when we're looking at a model, we're looking at uh, a bunch of different things. Um, the most important for me is actually the, the Spearman row, the rank correlation. Um, secondary metric is uh, the distance uh, between the performance of the top 20% versus the bottom 20%. The third thing is the batting average. So of the top 20%, what percentage of them actually beat the benchmark? And of the bottom 20%, what percentage of them are actually below the benchmark? And then the fourth thing is the statistical significance of that based on your time horizon and also based on the number of experiments that you've done. So if it took me a thousand experiments to result to, to get to my result, there's a really high probability chance that I kind of p-val hack my way there and that maybe the result I had was spurious. If I get a really high row um, that's got a really comfortable top bottom spread and I do that in two to three experiments, there's a good chance that it's somewhat comfortable. Um, you know, I know there's all kinds of other ways of looking at it. Certainly skew is another thing that I think is potentially important, you know, how consistent the signal over time. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't say looking at a confusion matrix in and of itself gives you much more value than the metrics that I just described. Yeah. Of course, you. I'm happy to debate that offline with anyone who disagrees. What is the average turnover of a portfolio constructed using your prediction? Uh, that completely varies. Um, so we have some long only shops that are, uh, you know, basically trying to make something like a mutual fund or an ETF plus plus where they're, they care about tracking error to the underlying benchmark and where they're constrained to anywhere between 25 and 40% turnover. Um, and then we have some hedge funds that are trading this every single day where the turnover can be as high as 5,000. I think I've actually seen as high as 7,000% a year where it's, it's trading over, you know, basically hundred percent of the portfolio every single day. Um, or something like more than 100 every single day. So uh, it, it depends, but the, the platform is extremely flexible. It can be used in sort of a long range, low turnover environment, and it can be used in a really heavy environment all the way up into market making and things like that. Thank you. Is it possible to clearly identify that a model is no longer working? Um, more like model ZK in our platform. I'll let you speak about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a fascinating question. So, Generally speaking, um, I guess there's kind of a few things. Um, are the, you can look at kind of the confidence uh, of, of the underlying model. Um, some of our models have the ability to do that, to sort of report. And, you know, um, if the confidence is going down, then that's also connecting to a period of time uh, in which you're experiencing a drawdown, well, that gives you a pretty good idea that you may in fact want to be 
Um, you know, the model might actually be fine. It just might be an environment where it doesn't really know how to model things. Um, if you have a model where it seems to have picked up on some factor biases, um, and that's corresponding to your drawdown, well, chances are you actually didn't have a very good model in the first place. Um, and when the regime shifted or, or something like that, um, you're just getting caught in the factor rotation and you kind of run into problems. So you can fix some of these things with portfolio construction, but ultimately if you have a biased underlying model, you can run into a problem. Um, generally speaking beyond that though, the vast majority of our models are actually fairly resilient. They're designed to be built in making these sort of idiosyncratic predictions. And the way that we evaluate our entire historical period is through a very long range set of sort of out of sample uh, sets where we're kind of simulating the trading environment historically versus today. Um, and so there are some telltale signs that a model signal might have broken down, but generally speaking, our systems are adaptive and they'll pick up on something new if it's possible with your feature space. Um, if it stays, you know, low confidence, low signal for a long period of time, probably that means you need to start thinking about some new features and some new ways of sort of revamping the model and, and analyzing the universe as a whole. Thank you. We're coming up at the top of the hour and we're trying to squeeze as many as we can. Uh, do you make use of independent component analysis? Um, yeah, I, I think that's too similar to the PCA question to, let's just, let's jump to okay, one. Great. You had mentioned in your description of the shaft, the term base oracle in the context of machine learning as a description of an entity that is universally correct. How is that term typically used in the machine learning domain and what did it mean in that context? If you'd like to answer that. This is the question of what, uh, what I mean by base component base oracle the term base oracle in the context of machine learning uh, oh, oh sorry sorry yeah so so an oracle is just something where uh, i'm i'm using uh that item to to generate y scores so where I'm, where I'm, I'm trying to use the oracle to basically tell me um what should i be predicting on right um so wh what i'm saying here is that i've got my simplified set of features and when I'm trying to build my linear regression that does a, a job of approximating my black box, um, I, I need something to give me Y variables to train on. Uh, and so where do I get those Y variables from? Well, by transforming those simplified representations of my space into the more advanced one, feeding them through the neural net and having the neural net tell me what it says uh, it predicted in those, those particular examples. So that's all an Oracle means here. It's just something where uh, you're using it to basically give you more training data. Thank you. Do you see any opportunity of using transfer learning here? Frequent recalibration and regeneration of his explanations could become expensive as the portfolios grow. Uh, it was a question around, uh, do we use transfer learning? Uh, is there any opportunity to use transfer learning? Because as uh, you know, you, you do uh, explanations more and more uh, on growing portfolios, it could, be, it could become expensive. Yeah. So. Uh, you could. We have found though that generally speaking, most forms of transfer learning actually degrade performance because they degrade the ability of the underlying model to sort of adapt to new environments. Um, and the other thing is that uh, higher accuracy results in a ridiculously high ROI in this space. Uh, so we just eat the server cost to, to be frank. Um, yeah, training some models in our system can be really, really, really expensive. Uh, you can use transfer learning, absolutely. And you know, if you're a startup fund and, and you don't want to be using a system like ours and you want to build it yourself, you can use uh, transfer learning um, and, and you'll get okay results. But for us, even a 1% improvement in model performance uh, at, you know, even if I was spending $5,000 in addition uh, to train that model, uh, the ROI very quickly uh, goes in favor of, of just eating that computation cost. Um, so yeah, you, you absolutely can, but it, we found it's almost never worth the ROI. Um, Great. That, that said, there, there are some ideas. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Go on. Uh, <laughs> go, go, I'll leave it for one more question. So go ahead, that's good. Okay. Um, I'm interested to know how you calculate shaft values in detail. Uh, are these done in a cross fold or are they out of sample? Yeah, okay, so this is gonna be a very long answer. Um, I, I think a lot of people kind of get confused on this point around when to do in sample and, and, and when to do out of sample. Um, and, you know, just really, really quickly, when you're building your actual prediction model, you want that to be fully out of sample. So if I go back to, uh, you know, I'm doing something that's like a 10-year back test, the way we think about it um, is, is with these rolling windows. Um, so for, say, 2008, we'll use data from 2000 to 2007. 
train your model on that and then make your predictions fully out of sample. Like for 2009, we'll use data on 2001 to 2008, train on that and then make your predictions out of sample. Um, the reason you don't wanna do cross-fold validation is because even though you're taking data uh, that the model hasn't seen directly, the model is aware of the time scale. So if I take data from say the past 20 years and I just randomly do take 10 tenfold cross validation and I just you know, take out 10% each time, um, the, the data for 2008 that I left out and then I'm feeding it through is going through a model that knows what happened in 2008. And the data that I use for 2018 is going through a model that knows what happened in 2018 uh, or whatever, right? Um, so it's really important actually to, to not do tenfold cross validation and to instead do a rolling window of models that's only ever using one set of data that's historic uh, to train on and then another set of data that's also historic um, but ideally different from the training set um, to evaluate the model itself. And so we do, you know, let's say eight years of rolling window for, um, for training and then let's say one year um, from the rolling window for validation from the beginning and one year of rolling window from before. Um, and there's other ways you can set up your validation where you wanna capture different regimes. That's a whole other topic in and of itself. Um, but then when you're actually evaluating the predictions that needs to be done 100% out of sample and you absolutely cannot do that in a, in a cross fold way. And you also don't wanna do your, your tenfold cross validation with the same set of data either because it'll learn that bias. Um, it'll learn to really heavily specialize in say 2008, 2007. Um, okay, now how does that relate to SHAP though? Well, when I'm trying to make Shapley explanations, I'm actually trying to figure out what did my model actually learn from that data? And so it's actually totally fine to use my in-sample data uh, to generate my Shapley models because I'm, I'm asking the question, what did it learn from, uh, from the underlying training data? Um, and, and in that case, you really, you can, you can subsample if you want as long as you're statistically significant. Uh, and so if you're, I'm trying to ask for global to explain, it's totally fine to use the same set of data that you trained your model on because that's actually the question you're asking. What did you learn from that data? Um, but then when I'm trying to look at my predictions, you know, why do you want to buy uh, Apple or why do you want to buy uh, Microsoft? For the prediction in a live setting, you're not going to have access to your, um, you're not going to have access to that data until you see it live. And so for the, the prediction level stuff, that is totally out of sample. I don't know if that makes a little bit of sense, but basically if you're trying to evaluate the, the global model as a whole, it's fine to use the same set of data that you trained on. But if you're trying to do prediction level stuff, you should generally be doing fully out of sample data. And that's just because that's how your uh, predictions are going to be running live. Um, and then, you know, you can actually sort of interestingly see different lessons if you use in sample data and out of sample data when you're generating your SHAP. And you can sometimes see that um, some of the things that it's confident on and not confident on relate to what I kind of learned from the underlying training data. Sorry, that was a really long winded answer, but kind of a complicated question. Thank you, Josh. I would like to squeeze in just one last question because I feel it uh, interesting and important to the audience. Dislocating market and world events test all modeling capabilities and approaches. What is special about Boosted that may offer advantages and how we can help, how we can navigate the impact of events in the financial markets? Yeah, so I'd say there's really two things. Well, I'd say three things, really. Um, number one, we do a really, really, really good job uh, of making sure that there's no sort of in sample or curve fitting uh, or look ahead or survivorship bias built into our models. Um, we do a really, really good job of evaluating models in a statistically consistent way. Um, and we, you know, we, and I have a whole other talk on this a few weeks ago where we talk about how we look for survivorship bias and look ahead bias and we evaluate statistical significance and things like that. Um, so number one, just the general quality of the models we build are a heck of a lot better battle tested uh, in a back tested environment. Number two, we focus on idiosyncratic signals. We don't, even if your goal is ultimately return, we don't actually train on return as a target. We train on something a little bit more idiosyncratic than that. Um, and then number three, we have models that just do a fantastically good job um, of sort of siphoning through the noise and learning and adapting to the markets quick. Um, you know, kind of if we wanna like relate to last year, um, in beginning of March, our signal broke down like it did for most people, but our portfolio construction on our risk mitigation did a fantastic job. Uh, and then by the time we get to the end of March, the system had kind of figured out the new regime and um, April, May, June, you know, it was printing a fantastic signal again. And this, I'm, I'm making broad strokes here. Of course, it really depends on how you use the system. But generally speaking, you did okay in March because the risk mitigation did a really good job of capturing the risks and preventing a drawdown. Um, 
you're you know by and large going to be more or less flat in that environment though. But as you come out of March, uh, the system was able to pick up on the new regime and learn just a heck of a lot faster than otherwise. Um, so it's kind of a combination of things. It's you know a system that does just a really really good job of making sure it's learning something real. Uh, it's something that is building you know relatively solid battle tested uh, systems. Um, you can learn really fast, and then you know on top of all of that, we have uh, portfolio construction, risk mitigation systems that I don't think you can find anywhere else. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for taking the time today for doing a great presentation. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who joined us today. Thank you.